It is Wednesday afternoon, May 18th, and we are happy to pick up in Genesis chapter 4. We'll start original in verse, I think, 22 or 23, but let's just back up and look from 20 on. We're talking about Kion's line, King's line. We're seeing from verse 20 that they dwell in tents. That's nomadic type lifestyle. We'll see Avram, Abram do that later. We saw that he had, by the time we come through the, um, the, you know, the begats, I'll put it that way. We come down to the last two that are mentioned, I believe, maybe they're not, but I'm jumping to verse <coughs> 21 where we have Yuval and we have, um, the other name is so similar. Okay, let me just look at my notes. I've got, well, let's take it in order. Oh, it was in verse 20, Yavel and then Yuval. I don't know how they kept those two separate. If you were hollering at them on the playground, I think they both probably came. <laughs> but the one name means to lead forth like a nomad would, leading out a nomadic lifestyle. This one, Yaval, had um, cattle and livestock. So we saw the pastoral life, as it's called, agriculture developing. We saw the domestication and the commercially producing animals that would it be. <coughs> not just sheep, but we've got animals for milk, skins for clothing, beasts of burden, you know, we see a development of that type of animal um, husbandry, I think they call it. Verse 21, we saw Yuval, the other one, um, had an ear for music, invented stringed wind instruments, it's showing the development of the arts. We've got either harp and organ or lyre and pipe, depending on what uh, version of the Bible you're using, but the idea is these different types of um, I want to call them ornaments. <coughs> they play in the orchestra. I just call them instruments. Okay, we're going to have a good class. Rochelle, Lord, give me a brain. Okay, verse 22, we had Tubal Cain, uh, or Kion, and that's the offspring of Kion. So that name is just reaching back to the, the originator of this family line. He was a forger of implements of bronze and iron and uh, instruction in that, so you have what they call metallurgy. You have craftsmen, you have the manufacture of tools, you have sciences and arts that are um, extracting metals from the ores, refining them and using them, you know, in different ways. <clears throat> so we see, um, really, a highly developed society coming along. This flies in the face of evolution that said it took thousands and thousands and thousands of years, millennia, you know, for each to develop, that you had one develop and it was a long time before they improved and morphed and changed and developed, you know, more talent and more abilities. And here we're seeing that this is all, this urbanization, agriculture, animal domestication, metallurgy, all of it quickly came together. We have descendants, but they, it was close in proximity to time. It didn't take hundreds of thousands of years. It just took a few generations. And in addition to that, also we saw from a phrase in verse 22, I believe it was. I'm not seeing it in 22, but somewhere in there. It, oh, no, actually it's not going to come out quite yet. But in chapter 5 and verse 1 is where we're going to see that it, it talks about it being written in a book. So we see they had written language. It wasn't just, you know, putting, you know, stick figures on a caveman's wall and the caveman pulling the, the girl by the hair in the club, you know, that's, no. they far more advanced than that from the time of Adam. Um, we've come seven generations to Lamech, and we see in Cain's, Cain's line, that name meant wild man or conqueror. I believe this is where we were leading off last time, so I'm going to start bringing that out. I better bring out verse 22, though. As for Zillah, she also gave birth to Tubal Cain. I talked about that, the forger of all implements of bronze and iron, and the sister of Tubal Cain, Cain, was Nama. Okay, now, from them, as we come down the next, to the seventh, the seventh being Lama, he said to his wives, we saw that he took two wives, Adah and Zillah in verse 19. We did that last week. So he says in verse 23, and remember his name being wild man or conqueror, we're seeing this is not a godly man, this is a wild man. This is one out doing wild. And he says, listen to my voice. Uh, you could have listened to my speech, or you might even have it, might even say listen to my words. I've got one version here that just simply says listen to me. 
but the Hebrew is indicating that it seems to be that he wrote a song. The idea I would say is it would be like a ballad. Maybe it was a poem, because they put poems to music also, but something that's telling his story, and somehow it was put to music. So I see that musical ability as he is expressing himself. What's he expressing? He's telling his <coughs> wives to hear him, to give heed to his speech. And this is why he says, For I have killed a man for wounding me, and a boy for striking me. If Kion is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. What is he saying? Let's go back to that first phrase. I have slain, or I have killed. We're beginning to see violence filling the face of the earth. We know that Kion, king, killed his brother of all, and apparently that's not the isolation. It's not that there were no more murders for thousands of years, because we've got right down here, Lamech, in one sense, it almost seems like he's priding himself in it. Hey, look at me. I've killed two people. I've got two notches on my belt. It maybe he's meaning it that way. He's taking pride and he's boasting. But when he does put in that phrase, for I killed a man for wounding me, that does sound like he thinks it was in self-defense. So it might not be as much boasting as it is just defending himself. But if it is boasting, he's taking pride in it. And, uh, um, you know, we, we don't know. But the same word for slain is the same word of what Cain did to to Abel in the Hebrew. There's no differentiation there. So even if it was self-defense, and remember we're talking about back in this day and what God's commandments were to the people of this day. At this point in time, God has not put into man capital punishment. It was not instituted yet. And he showed that he didn't want man taking into his own hands judgment. Because remember, Kion had a mark put on him so that nobody could kill him. He was sure, you know, they're going to take me out, Lord. And the Lord protected him from that and showed that at this stage, judgment should come from God and God alone. God judged Cain harshly. God sent him out. He wandered the rest of his life and not in a happy mode. He was never satisfied. He couldn't work the ground like he did before. He wasn't a prolific farmer. Life was not easy for him. He didn't get away with it. And we know he faced ultimate judgment, or he will the day he stands before God at the great white throne judgment, where all through all time who have not turned to the Lord stand before him for judgment according to their deeds, the way that they will spend the rest of eternity. Apparently there's some sort of, um, I'm going to say degrees in hell, something where there's, you know, more suffering for those who deserve that more and less suffering for those who deserve less. But at the same time, even in the lesser fold, you're still absent from God. You're absent from love, from light, from glory, from everything that's wonderful, and you're in pain and <coughs> suffering forever and ever and ever. So even lightly, it's not lightly. Yes? Is this, is this still a time when um, if you did something like that and you go to this one city of refuge? Or is that farther than scripture? That's further down. They didn't have the cities of refuge yet where they could go and and grab the horns of the altar and be safe until they could be presented in court, present their case, and, and judgment would come out. That comes later under law. So at this point, Cain's just out there wandering, but he started a family and he had um, his descendants this one that we're coming down to. We do see progressive degeneracy among humanity. We, we don't see them getting better, we see them getting worse, and we know that very soon we're going to be in the time of Noah where it says every thought of man was only evil continually. So they're definitely not getting better and better, and that's to me what absolutely flies in the face of evolution that says, you know, we, we got better, we got better, <coughs> we got better. Is that somebody's hand up or is that on our screen? Because it's on my, my square. Okay. Cool. That's fine. You can stay there as long as I don't think somebody's trying to get my attention with a... <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So, um, again, we see so much proof against evolution right from uh, the beginning. You know, we just see it time and again. But God's pattern was you don't take life. You leave that to me to judge what is to be done. And yet, here's one that he either prided himself in, in it because it was self-defense or for whatever reason. 
Why does he say at the end of it that if Cain's avenged sevenfold, he's avenged seventy and sevenfold? If I give it to you in this translation, if I said, if God promises a sevenfold vengeance on anyone who kills Cain, I myself, Lamech speaking, am guaranteed a seventy-sevenfold retribution on anyone who hurts me. If God's going to do something to, to Cain seven times, or to someone who comes against Cain seven times worse, then he deserves to do for me 77 times worse. Maybe again because he's saying because my killing was only in self-defense, where King couldn't pride himself in that. King had, uh, it was not out of self-defense. So he might be saying that, he might be saying there should be greater leniency on him because it was not <coughs> deserved. Um, but what I see is humanism, self-centered perspective, I don't see anything saying he's sorry for what happened. You know, a regret over the loss of a, a life, a, a precious life has been lost. You know, I don't see any of that. I just see the degeneration. He also focused, remember, on his beautiful wives. He makes a point in Scripture letting us know he had to, oh, oh, look what I've got on this arm and this arm. And I see a lot of pride in him. I'll just in my personal take of the Scriptures, I think he thought he was he was something but for all his boasting for everything that he tries to present here his descendants that he has here that that he's got these two wives you know what scripture says of him after this nothing zip zip zippity doo dah. nothing in scripture's view he came to nothing where does pride get us nowhere nowhere so in verses 17 to 22, we have the records of seven generations now, as I said, from Cain to, and I'll say it in English, Jabel and Jubal. That record ends in murder. We've got Lamech killing two. It's also seven generations from Adam to Hanukh, you call him Enoch, that we're going to look at in a different line, not in this line, not in Cain's line, but when we get to chapter 5 and we do verses 22 to 24, it's seven generations down again, and where Lamech is, ungodly and killing, we have Enoch. And this is the Enoch that so pleased God that he was taken home without seeing death, a picture of the rapture for us. Now from Adam to Enoch, to the righteous one, was approximately 622 years. What we're doing to get that is we go by the age of the father when they gave birth to the son. And by figuring it down through there mathematically, we're probably very close to 622 years. If it gave it exactly, we're at 622 years. So most likely, if that's seven generations, Adam through a different son down to Hanuk, to Enoch, then Adam through Cain down to Lamech is probably about the same. You know, we can't say exactly, but just giving you a rough idea that uh, they had seven generations in approximately 600 years. That sounds like, wow, wait a minute, Rochelle, that's a long time. <laughs> but when you remember, how old does Adam live to be? 930. Very good, good memory, 930 years old. So 600 years is two-thirds of his lifetime. If we put that into perspective today, let's say a person lives to 100, we're talking, you know, two-thirds is, what, 66 years? So does that put it a little more perspective? How many of you would say 66 years is short? <laughs> I think we're all close enough to that. <coughs> we're going to say, yeah, we can relate to that, okay? So put it in that kind of perspective. It hasn't been ages and ages, hundreds of thousands of years for all of this, for this development. And we're going to start to see some of these people easily could have known each other, could have been related, um, related literally too, but could have been relating in each other's lives. So we'll see that as we go on. Let's go to verse 25 and we see that Adam, Adam had relations with his wife again. Remember he had presented to us, he had Cain and he had Abel. Where are his two sons? One's off wandering away from Adam, not being able to live near his, his dad. The other son is dead. What's Adam to do now? He's supposed to have, or his wife Eve, is supposed to have 
seed that <coughs> leads to the promised Redeemer, the promised Messiah. So obviously, if we were writing to NASA, we'd say, uh-oh, NASA, we've got a problem. <laughs> but with God, there is no problem because we have another son raised up. She, um, we're talking Chava in English, um, Eve, I mean in Hebrew and English, Eve, it says she gave birth to a son and named him in English Seth, in Hebrew Shep, for she said, God has appointed me another offspring in place of Aval, for Kion killed him. So we see that she thinks Seth is the appointed one, is the substitute for Aval, Abel, who was supposed to be that one. Well, or actually she thought, originally she thought Cain because she thought her firstborn. She thought as soon as she gave birth to son, this was a redeemer. Well, he was anything but, you know, we saw that. Avel, who had the righteous, uh, righteousness within him, still was not the redeemer. Sheth, Sheth or Seth means appointed or substituted. So obviously she's saying again, aha, I've got the son. This is the one who is appointed for him to be that, that redeemer. She's still thinking that. Bless her heart, she has no reason not to. She has nothing to compare to. She doesn't see hundreds of generations of other families. It's still all their family. And remember, we know that they probably had other sons and daughters um, during this time also. We never read names so that we don't know. And anytime you read names, you are reading most likely mythical literature. It may not always be mythical, but I, everything that comes to my mind is mythical when they give names. What we do know from our scripture that we can take authoritatively and believe every word is that Adam was 130 when this took place. Um, where do I get that? I know it tells us. It tells us in chapter 5 and verse 3. We'll get there shortly so you can sneak peek if you want or you can take my word for it. But Adam was 130 when Seth was born. So how old was Eve? As Pastor Gil would say, it's a test question. If Adam was 130 when Seth is born, how old is Eve? Oh, she's a year older. She's than Adam? 131. Yeah, she, oh, no, she lived a year longer than Adam. We don't know how old she lived to be. Oh, I read it somewhere. That she lived, There's your literature. She lived 931 years. There's your literature. It was in here somewhere. If you find it in your Bible, show me, and I'll eat my words. <laughs> but at least you got the right answer. If Adam's 930, wasn't Eve made at the same time as Adam? Yeah. Very quickly, you know, it's not that it was hundreds <coughs> of years. So Eve would have been 130 when Seth was born also. It was yeah. a Bible study. <laughs> On YouTube? Okay. Yeah. They may have a source of they feel they could say it authoritatively. I could say it could be. You know, I, I can't tell them they're wrong, but I can't tell them they're right either. Well, I couldn't okay. find you, so I listened to the other. <laughs> Don't take authority what I say. Find it in the Word of God. And I know you know. I know where you're going. <laughs> okay, but it's showing her faith. By the name she gives her son, she's showing her faith. I'm standing in faith believing what you said to me, God, that we have quoted as in chapter 3 and verse 15, that that, yeah, is going to be fulfilled. Remember, that's our first messianic promise, <coughs> that one would come from their line who would be what, who we call the Messiah. Um, so, and again, they, they probably had other kids in between this, but she's looking for that one, and she feels a witness from the Lord that this is the one She's right in the sense he is going to be the one that leads to it. It is through his line that we are going to finally get down to the Redeemer. Can we trace it all? It gets broken, but we'll see that we can take it back. Because we know we can only go as far back as Noah and his three sons because of the flood. But we have the records before that brought down to Noah. So we can connect via the Word of God. So, yes, it is Seth's line that led to Noah's line that led to Shem, not, not Seth, Shem, Noah's son, who leads on down to David, who leads on down to Messiah. You look huh? like, yeah, how? <laughs> Through a lot of begatting. <laughs> uh, but it, if you follow it, and you can, you can get sources that can help you, you know, but it's scriptures like these that tell us 
this one fathered this one, this one fathered that one. And there are gaps. We don't have everything. Again, remember, we couldn't contain it in the Word of God. If they had 50 kids, God's sparing us having to go through 47 other names. He's giving us just the three we need to know about. Okay? It is a good thing. I hear just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. <laughs> because we don't want to get sidetracked with everything else. And that's why I give you a word of caution because there is so much out there about the Garden of Eden, about what life was like in the beginning, about Adam's two wives. And it gives the name of the other wife. I won't even glorify them by putting it out on Zoom. But I'm just warning you, if you're reading those, the, that's man's literature. You cannot put that on the same level as the Word of God. The only thing we can take as authority is the Word of God. So if I can't see it in one of these 66 books, I'm not going to accept it as absolutely perfect and errant. <coughs> Could it be good history? Yes. Could it be right? Yes. Could it be wrong? Yes. <laughs> okay. So I'm not going to put my faith in it. I'm not going to take it to the bank. I'm not going to trust it. But anything in the Word of God, I will. So I fully believe that Seth is the one that God gave to Adam and Eve, and it is through his line that the Redeemer eventually will come. Now, notice one little difference here. We have in verse 25 that God has appointed it's Eve speaking because it says, um, and I should have backed up, named him Seth for she said, God has appointed me another offspring in place of a vow for Cain killed him. So it sounds very clearly like Eve named her son. Okay? That's, that's where we're at. Now, go back to chapter 3 and verse 25 for just a moment. And I've got to get there too. Genesis 3. And verse 25, and it's coming up, Genesis 3 and verse 25, we have no verse. Okay, what am I doing wrong? Because there has to be a verse. <laughs> I know my point, but I want to prove it by scripture. What did I do wrong? And I've gone over my notes a million times. No, contrast the mother giving name in 320. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Go back to chapter 4. Stay in chapter 4 where we were. That's where I wanted it. It's verses 25 and 26. We're going to see the contrast. So in 25, she names him. In 26, to Seth, to him also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. So where mom gave the name initially, now it looks like it's shifted and the father is giving the name. Um, doesn't matter, it's just a, a note of interest of a change because we're going to see a little more changes coming as we go on down the line. Just, just put a little check there and, and you'll see why I talk about it at another point. But he names his son Enosh, and Enosh means mortal frailty. Okay, it comes from the root that means to be feeble or frail. Now Enosh is going to live to be 905 years old. So obviously it can't be talking really about human frailty because if he was frail physically, I don't think he would have made it 900 years. That's a long time to live if physically he was feeble. Seth lived 912 years and they didn't say Seth was feeble or frail. And we're only talking a difference of seven years. So it probably means something else. If it doesn't mean physical, what could we be looking at it meaning? And the quickest, and I think the correct answer would be spiritually. That Seth is aware of mankind's deep spiritual needs. We're going to see Seth is a godly line. I think his focus was on godliness, and I think it was a, a prophecy that, that, well, they're already seeing it because the, the others that are around them, Lamech has killed too. You know, we have these other generations, these other families. Seth's looking around at his siblings and their offspring, and he's saying, wow, you know, man, he's pretty messed up spiritually. And he gives his son a name that's reflecting that, that we're in a spiritual need. Often the names dictated what was going on around them. 
whether they knew it or whether it was given to them prophetically, we can draw from it. So um, really what we're seeing here is the deep spiritual need. Question or not? Okay. The deep spiritual need rather than the physical need. And if you're looking for where did I get the Seth lived 912 years, how do I know that? Did I read that in other literature that I just told you not to fall into that trap? No. Go to chapter 5 and verse 8. We'll be there shortly, but you'll see it there. Okay, so we've got Adam giving birth to Seth, Seth giving birth to Enosh. <laughs> and at this time, and this goes along with if we're thinking spiritually, and what's the importance of Scripture? Is the importance of Scripture to just give us genealogical names? No. It's to teach us spiritually. Is it to help us not be weak physically in our humanness? No. We don't read, you know, t take enough vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E. <laughs> we don't read that in Scripture. But does Scripture tell us spiritual vitamins to eat daily so that we are healthy in the Lord? Yes, absolutely. So, keeping that thought in mind, hold on to that because it's going to be important as we go into the next couple of chapters, especially by the time we get to chapter 6. To Seth, the Seth, oh, I'm sorry, the end of it. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, there's two interpretations of what that phrase means. In the Hebrew, the word upon could be also interpreted by, B-Y, rather than upon, okay? So we would say that men began to call by the name of the Lord. One view is this was the beginning of public worship, public prayer. This would mean now that, in essence, God's presence, as we've known it, dealing individually, as he did with Adam and Eve, as he did with them outside of the garden. We know that he talked with the family, that now we're going into more of a, um, a congregation, a church. I mean, I'm not saying church began here, don't get me wrong. Church doesn't begin until... Acts chapter 2, it doesn't begin until we're on the other side of Yeshua's earthly life. But it could be that there was an assembly that would get together now, that there is something different. What would be different is that now individually they weren't being blessed with that presence of God the same way Adam and Eve were initially and Cain and Abel were initially and we don't know how far it went down. We just know that obviously we don't have one place where we know the presence of the Lord is dwelling and where we see manifestation. For us, it's all different, way different, because we have the Ruch Kodesh, the Holy Spirit, within us. But remember, this is back before the Holy Spirit's given. This is back before um, the church has begun. So we've got something different. Let me put it this way. Let me make it clear this way. God spoke face to face with Adam and Eve. He walked in the cool of the garden. They saw him in some sort of manifestation. They talked with him. They didn't see a woohoo. They saw something. You know, they could relate. Okay? We're not going to read that that was happening to all of these other people as we come down through our timeline. We're going to see that Moshe went up into the cloud into the presence of the Lord. The children of Israel said, You represent us, you go before God. They didn't see God face to face. Moshe begged for that. God, I want to see you. Because you can't see him in your humanity and survive. You have to be changed. And yet Moshe was so hungry for God, for, for seeing his friend face to face. And God so welcomed him in that, called Moshe a friend of God. I, I want to hear that. I want God to say, there's my friend Rochelle. Well, he gave Moshe a special blessing and enabled him to see just partially what was left behind by God. And it set him aglow so much they covered it so that it wouldn't freak the people out and it wouldn't scare them as it diminished. But you see the change. And to me, this is why they're starting to be less spiritual because they're not right there in the presence of the Lord in the same way. When we're in the presence of the Lord, it holds us to a better conduct than when we're away from the presence of the Lord. We all know that. So I'm just seeing a shift, a sad shift, because God wanted that intimate fellowship with his creation. Yes, Dora? So how long did you, do you think it happened after they were kicked out of the garden? I don't know. <laughs> how long do I think it was 
that this all happened from them being kicked out of the garden. I mean, they, they couldn't see God like, like Adam and Eve did. We're guessing, but we're, I'm going to say by the time Seth is naming his child, it's gone. Because he's calling his child, uh, he, he's calling frail. Spiritually, we're frail as a people. You know, he's, he's not meaning his son is. His son's just born. How could his son be frail or not yet? But the circumstances he's living in, he apparently had a godly attitude and a godly heart. And he's looking around and saying, wow, you know, we're spiritually weak here. How many of us are doing that today in our world? You know, we really are. We're aching. You get in the middle of some of this evil. You turn on the news at night and, oh, I don't even want to go there. But if, if I was naming a child for my environment, I could easily name my child Seth. You know, spiritually, or Enosh, I'm sorry, Enosh. Um, spiritually, you know, frail. So I'm going to say, this is 130 years when, when Seth was born. Seth has grown up enough to have a child, but let's just round it off and say 150, 160 years. You know, and again, if we're talking a lifespan of almost a thousand years, you're talking like a ten-year-old's life today. Very short time. Satisfied? As much as we can be. <laughs> keep thinking. Keep asking the questions. But I'm I'm going to guess that we're talking. You know, very short, very short in comparison to it. Okay, so that's one view. Um, and by the way, if that be true, I believe that the Garden of Eden isn't somewhere where they're seeing it now. There isn't that one special place where the angels were there, the flaming sword that kept them. I think that must be gone from the face of the earth or they've moved from it or something because we're not hearing anything in relation to it. Like we hear the tabernacle, we hear the temple, you know, go into the, the tabernacle, bring your sacrifice, the priests will go into the Holy of Holies, the children of Israel saw the Shekinah glory. My, uh, my uh, group in the desert that um, um, is, well, they're Shema Yisrael, they're uh, Messianic. Um, one of them down there loves to say, because we've just had a move, we're in transition from one location where we're meeting to another, and they start our, our meetings with, Cloud by day, fire by night, and you know we're following the cloud, and we're 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 loving it because we were studying the cloud, we were studying the fire, everything just came together. But you see the spiritual, you know, what we're talking about with that. And again, we're in a different age by the time you come down to the church age. But you've just got to realize something was being lost for mankind much earlier on. We're going to see it become so degenerate that there literally is one family left that's spiritually minded. One family. I've got in my house right now one, two, three, four families represented that have spiritual roots in, in each one of those families. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I've got more on my Zoom camera than Noah had that were believers <clears throat> in his entire existence. Everyone who was alive in his day when the flood came, we got more on Zoom <coughs> than he had. 11 on Zoom. We have 11 on Zoom, okay. <laughs> and we're small today. We're usually bigger in number, but yet we got more than Noah. I can't imagine how horrible that must have been to be living through that because this is bad enough for me. I, I would not care to have it come down to, to eight souls left that, that loved the Lord. But we see it going. Now, second view, if the word is really meant to be more by the name of the Lord rather than upon. So upon, think of it in your mind. If I'm calling upon the name of the Lord, I'm crying out to the Lord, I'm looking to him, you know, for help. I'm, we're in prayer, we're in the word, you know, that would be what it meant. If I'm being called by the name of the Lord, that's describing what I'm like. That would be a way to say, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, for those who know what I mean by Christian, you have to be careful using that today. I'm a Messianic believer, I also have to be careful with that because everybody can have different definitions. But you're getting my point. If it's describing them, that there were those who called, were called by the name of the Lord, then we've got a line, that, and it is a godly line, that could be differentiated from that, and I'll say it, evil line. You've got the spiritual line now, 
you've got the wicked line. You can see the contrast going out. And I really think, I'm not going to say the first is wrong, because I think really both could be right, but I definitely think that you've got those who are now identifying themselves, and that means that you have those who are not identifying themselves, just like we do in this world today. We know when we meet another believer who says, I believe in, and spells it out, that we've met one who's being called by the name of the <clears throat> Lord. That's our identity. I belong to the Lord. He's my master. I'm his servant. But I can show you, I can go right out my door and find you plenty of people who say, I'm nobody's servant. I belong to me. Me, myself, and I, thank you very much. You know, so this is what I think we're seeing. We're seeing a contrast here from Cain's line, the flesh, the ungodly, the murderous, the I'm proud of myself. Even if it was self-defense, he was still proud of the fact he killed two. There was no regret in him either, the same as there wasn't in Cain. But there's that. And then you have this godly line that is telling you, wow, I'm looking around and I'm seeing spiritual need. I'm seeing spiritual desert. And I want something different. I'm going to call on the name of the Lord. I'm going to be called by the name of the Lord. I'm going to be his kid. I belong to him. That's what I think we're seeing develop. It's not something that's just come down in our century. We can go all the way back. So keep that in mind, especially when I get to chapter 6, where you have to hold on and remember that. But chapter 5, I think we're going to move kind of fast because it is a geneal ge genealogical, it's the genealogy. Okay. <laughs> I'll get that out sooner or later. But... It'll go a little bit faster than when we're dealing with some doctrinal issues. But as I put out in my text today, for all those who think, how boring, hey, study the, the begets with somebody who can tell you about the names, and it comes, becomes very interesting. And we're going to look at some differences, um, or some details, I mean, not differences, but details in these names. So let me prepare it by telling you that we're going to be given continually a name of a father, and a son, a name of a father and a name of a son. Now, that does not mean this is the firstborn son of that father. And in other words, if we don't have it right here, yes, we do. We have it by verse 3. We have the days of Adam after he became the father of Seth. Well, if I asked you who was Adam's first kid, anybody? Hmm? Who was Adam's first kid? Was Seth Adam's first kid? No. 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 Cain was. Then Abel. Then Seth. And this is only all the names we know. So obviously when we read in chapter 5 and verse 3 that Adam's the father of Seth, he's not saying that's his firstborn son. And that's true through this list. Just because this is the child name doesn't mean it was firstborn, but there's a reason why this is the name that is given. That's why I tell you there's, there's reason in our genealogy. It's not, the purpose of it wasn't to keep records. The purpose of it wasn't to say, here's, you know, the order. The purpose of it is different. It's God's purpose for his reason. We know Seth is most important out of all the other kids that Adam and Eve had that we don't even get names of because Seth's line leads to the Messiah's line. So God's not going to bother to give us 20 million other names to get our minds confused and get our eyes off that godly line. He's going to build that godly line for us and, and teach us through it. So Seth is the third son. It's the same thing when we get to Noah's firstborn, uh, chapter 10 and verse 21. The first one listed is Shem, but we're going to see that Japheth was older than Shem. So Noah's sons aren't listed in order. And there are many other times also, but both Seth and Shem will lead to the Messianic line, or a part of the Messianic line. That's why they're given predominance, because there's an importance to, to them, and the others fade away. Okay, so having that in mind, we'll start now in chapter 5, and we read right in the beginning, depending on your version, uh, New American says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. You may have, my complete Jewish says, here's the genealogy of Adam, but that left something out. It really is good to go back to our Hebrew and see what was there, because when we see that this is the book 
of the generations. What am I telling you if it's a book? This is a book. What makes this a book? Good words. Words. Very good. Written words. That makes it a book. That's what we're picking up here. We don't just have an oral passing down. We have a written record. Okay? This is the written record of the genealogy of Adam. And it will go on. And, and we see that expressed also. The really the only other time that it gets real specific like that is in Matthew, Matthew 1 and verse 1, and that genealogical line also takes you right down to Messiah. It shows you how Jewish it is, because when you open, and let me just read it to you, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but for any on Zoom who will read it later and don't necessarily know it, let me show you how Matthew starts. Matthew does not start and say, Adam gave birth to Seth. In Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the record of the genealogy, the book of the genealogy, the written word of the genealogy of Yeshua, the Messiah, the Mashiach, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, was David the first of Abraham? I have to work my way backwards. These weren't firstborn kids, okay? We, we know there's a lot of children that came in between those lines. It goes on, it says, Abraham was the father of Isaac. Was Isaac Abraham's firstborn? No. Good. I want to see head shaking. I want to know you're with me, okay? We know Isaac wasn't the firstborn. It was Ishmael. Then we're going to see the father of Jacob. Jacob's the father of Judah and his brothers. What number? Judah, uh, let me tell you, um, Jacob had 12 sons. What number son was Judah? Was he one? No. No. Was he two? No. Nope. Was he three? Was he four? Ha! <laughs> <laughs> really <did>. A plus. <clears throat> he was four. He was four. He was the fourth son. So why is Judah, four out of twelve, the one that gets named here? Because whose line did Yeshua come through? He came through Judah. He had to come through Judah because that's was prophesied in Genesis, and it may be a year or two before we get there, but we'll see that in Genesis. <laughs> it's just it's in the 49th chapter, so it'll be a while before we get there. But here's my point. Both times we're told they're written records, and these records are specifically written for a reason. They're not meant just to be the records of everybody who was ever born and everybody who ever died. So it's not City Hall that's got all the names. It's, it's the called out assembly of the Lord's line for a purpose that we're being told. So with that all in mind, back in Genesis 5, the generations of Adam. Now, we're seeing that there's two books that contain names that we'll see in Scripture. One is under Adam, and that gives us the fallen race. This is like the federal headship. We're all under, you know, we're all human. We're all, we all came from Adam. But we also see that there is a group of people in Scripture all under another federal head, and that's the head Yeshua. That is our redeemed race. So we have all of humanity was born from Adam, but we have out of that whole sea of people, we have a smaller group. That's the redeemed race. That's those who come in to Yeshua, who are, who are adopted into his line, who he's our head. So if you're asked, who's the head of your family? Don't tell them Adam, even though that's true. But tell them Yeshua, if he's in your heart, because he's your head. He's the, the head patriarch of our family, because we're part of the redeemed race. How do I get that name? Go to 1 Corinthians uh, 15. 1 Corinthians 15, I love that chapter by the way, the beginning of it tells the death, burial, and resurrection, and there's just a lot packed in, in 15, but go all the way down to 21 and 22, it says, for since by a man came death, okay, Adam brought death into the human race, so also in Mashiach, in Christ, all will be made alive. Um, let's read verse 22 there also. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. I think I just read that twice, sorry. I don't know, read 21 and 22. But the point here is, 
We all are alive humanly through Adam, but only those who are in Christ are alive spiritually. So we see the difference there. Go down to verses 45 to 47, and here we read, So it also is written, and notice it's written, The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Who is the one who is the life-giving spirit? Sure. Well, okay. <laughs> you, Roger said the Holy Spirit, but I'm, I'm looking for Yeshua here. I'm looking for Jesus. Or, you know, I mean, it's the Godhead. Okay, but when we see it because of the flesh here, Adam is called the first Adam, the first man, and Yeshua is being called the last Adam because he is the one that came to redeem the Adamic race. So that's why I was looking for the human factor that we get through the name Yeshua Jesus. Um, okay, however, the spiritual is not the first, but the natural, then the spiritual. You can't, you're not spiritual and then born physically. That's a false religion. Anybody know? That's Mormonism, okay? You were alive, you were in heaven, God sent this spiritual soul down to be housed into this earthly body, okay? Scripture right here is telling us, no, you're born naturally, then in your natural, you can turn to the Lord and become spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy, the second man is from heaven. That's the one who came from heaven, not us before we existed here on earth. The Lord, he himself is the one who was alive and came to earth. As in the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. As in the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. So we've got an earthly race under Adam. We've got a spiritual race under Yeshua Jesus, the redeemed race. Okay? Now, again, we're back to Genesis 5. And I've already told you, we're looking at the fact that the book shows us it was written. It wasn't just transmitted orally. And generations in the Hebrew means a history or a chronology. It's telling us a development. It's not saying here is its creation, the way we saw creation in the beginning. But it's telling us here, here's how the line developed. Okay? And so we just see a passage of time. Now, it's telling us that this is the generations of Adam. Of Adam. That probably is Adam's way of saying what's been written down to this point, I'm signing my name. This, the, I'm, I'm saying I've written my story now. Here's my signature. That's probably how it's met, meant. Most people look at it the other way and think it's starting here. But from our Hebrew idioms, the way they are written, and I told you that before we started verse by verse in Genesis, that we see a number of times through this book that the, when it says it's the book of the generations up, we've got Adam, the next one's going to be Noah, we will finally get to Moses, Moses Moshe, that each one apparently kept their records. That's nothing strange. Don't a lot of us do that today? We've got our family tree. We know the family name. Some have wanted to do research and have found out many names and many generations and filled in many blanks. Others only know a little bit. But we pass down to our children, our family, our family tree. I'm not going to pass down to my children Patty's history. Oh, you need to know Patty's great, great, great granddaddy. No, I'm going to say you need to know my great, great, great granddaddy. Okay, so Adam's saying, here's what I know. And he brings it down. Noah says, here's what I know. And he brings it down. So someone's going to find that verse that tells us that Moshe wrote the Torah. That he wrote the first five books of our scripture. And they're going to say, wait a minute, Rochelle. You're telling me something wrong here. Because the scripture very clearly says that Moses is the author. Well, what we're seeing is that Moses was the overall author. The books were passed down. Adam's not alive by the time we get to Moshe, but the books were, were passed, Adam passed his books down, Noah passed his books down, we'll see the other signatures, and Moshe had the great responsibility of bringing it together, weaving it through so that he tells the complete story all the way down, and so he's the one that really actually put it all together, compiled it, put it in order, and put his stamp of his name on it in the end, and he's the one given credit. It would be like someone helped do a little bit of research. They only researched a chapter for you in your book of 
hundreds of chapters, so you might be given credit for help in the where the credits are given, but you're not given the authorship. The authorship is the one who did the main thrust of all of the work. Now, I will tell you honestly, there are those who do not agree with what I just said. They absolutely believe that it was Moses, it was Moses alone. How did Moses know how creation happened? Well, God spoke to him directly and told him how creation happened. And so that's where Moses got it directly from God alone. Now, if you want to believe that, I have no argument with you. Because the scripture isn't so dogmatic that I have to say yay or nay. Either way, the ultimate author is God and God alone. Whether he passed down... You know, it worked with Adam to, to compile Adam's historical um, area, which he would have been very accurate in because he was there, and he kept passing it down that way, or whether God did put it into Moses' ear and into his head when Moses was, was writing it. Either way, God's our ultimate authority. God's our author. God's the one who gets the credit. And because we know God brought it down to man, in our new, our Brit Chodesh, our new covenant, we are told inspired, inerrant word of God. That's in First Timothy. Now, you've got to remember, not all the books of the Bible were written by the time Timothy is saying that, but what we're being told is what is brought to us as the books of the Bible is written perfectly by God. We have to understand it, but everything is inerrant there. If we find discrepancies we have to dig deeper and find the true understanding so that the discrepancy goes away because God never contradicts himself his word is old his word is authoritative his word is perfect so whether he gave it to Adam and Noah and all the rest down to Moshe or directly to Moshe makes no difference to me it's still God's word it's still authority it's still trustworthy in every detail so We'll go on. By the way, if you want to see where Noah's signature comes in, since it's the next one, that's chapter 6 and verse 19. So in my humble opinion, from 5.1 to 6.19, we have what Noah compiled and what he would pass down that eventually came to Moshe. Either way, okay? Now, in Adam's line, what we're going to see here is that there are 13 that are recorded in Adam's line. 13 in scripture happens to be the number of rebellion and apostasy. I'll show you that real quickly in just a moment. But what we're seeing then is Adam's line of humanity, we're going to realize, is rebellious and full of apostasy. Well, we know that's true already from what we've said. Lamech alone is killed too and it is prideful about it. We've got Cain killing the first one in the very beginning. But how do we see 13 in scripture? as the number of rebellion and apostasy. You know, we just had Friday the 13th, and for those who are superstitious, they buy into that and they get all worried about what's going to happen on Friday the 13th. I'm saying there's nothing superstitious, but it is seen as the number standing for rebellion or apostasy. Go to Genesis uh, 14 and 4 for our first example. Bereshit, Genesis 14 and verse 4 and we read in that verse 12 years they had served Chetelamar but the 13th year they rebelled okay so 13 a period of rebellion now go with me to the book of Esther Hadassah Esther um, and when you get to the book of Esther go to chapter 3 and Esther chapter 3 verses 12 and 13 tell us then the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month, and it was written just as Hamon, Haman, commanded to the king's satraps, to the governors who were over each province, to the princes of each people, each province according to its script, each people according to its language, being written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring. Verse 13, letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, to annihilate all the Jews. Would that be a, a rebellion? Would that be apostatizing against God's will? God's, the Jews were God's chosen people. Here we've got plan to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, women and children, in one day. And what day is it? The 13th day of the 12th month. 
So again, 13 seeing as a great rebellion here. A decree goes out to wipe the Jews off of the face of the map. Now, Israel marched around a defiant Jericho, Jericho. Joshua 6, the walls of Jericho fall down. You know the story well. If you know the story well enough, you know that they marched around six days, one time each day. On the seventh day, they marched around six times, and on the seventh they marched and they blew the trumpets and they shouted their praises to the Lord, and the walls fell down. Okay, so six days they went around at once. That's six. Seventh day they went around it six more times. Six plus six is twelve. On the seventh time around, they turn to praising God and the apostate city of Jericho, the evil Jericho, fell in judgment. Thirteen, number of rebellion or apostasy. The book of Judges is a cycle of Israel's history. They get themselves in trouble because they forget their God, they cry out to God, he raises them up, a deliverer, a judge who brings them back, they get back in line with God, everything is good, and they forget their God. And they fall into rebellion, and they get into trouble, and they finally cry out, and they get raised up another judge who brings them back, and things are good. And when things are good, they forget their God. Now, do you want me to do that 13 times? <laughs> if I tell you the whole book of Judges, I have to do it 13 times. So we see a cycle again in, in the book of Judges enumerating 13 judges, 13 times of this apostasy of the people, the, the children of Israel with their God. Let me take you to the New Covenant, to the Baruch Mark chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, is going to give us a list. I'll bet you can't guess how many um, words there in that list there are. And let me tell you what the list is before you give me that number. We're going to see from Mark 7, and verse 21, we are going to see, For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed the evil thoughts. Okay? So, evilness is going to come out of the heart of man. Now, how many descriptive words of evil are we going to get in Mark 7, 21 to 23? 13. 13. I did wonder if my class was awake today if I put them to sleep out of boredom. <laughs> 13. Okay, let's read them. This is what Yeshua said is characteristic of the depraved heart. Let's see if he's right. Fornication, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting, wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, Foolishness. I just listed 13 characteristics, and that is, uh, every single woman, a depraved heart. That comes out of depravity. So again, 13 showing us rebellion, depravity, apostasy. Where was that at? Mark 7, 21 to 23. And without going to every single one in the book of Revelation, we have the name for Satan, where he's called a dragon, 13 times. That great dragon, that evil one, <clears throat> Satan, it goes on and on. 13 times in the book of Revelation. So, I think I get it, Lord. In, thir in Scripture, 13 is not a good number. Maybe that's why people got superstitious with that number. Not that I'm saying get superstitious. But let me give you the flip side. Go with me to Matthew, to Matthew chapter 1. You, we were there not long ago. That go back there to Matthew chapter 1 and this time go all the way down to verse 17. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 17 we will read there. So all the generations from Abraham to David, Abraham to David, are 14 generations. From David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. From the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. So we get the number 14 three different times in this one verse. Notice never was it 13. We're given 14 generations that we hang it on, hang it on, and hang it on. And believe me, in Jewish teaching, they know this, this we've got 14, we've got 14, we've got 14. They just don't believe he's Yeshua. But they teach these generations. Well, what is the number 14? It is... 
um, is, is seven doubled. Okay, seven and seven are fourteen. Seven is God's complete number, God's number of perfection. So it's as if we're saying this would be perfect God and perfect man if he were living the way, you know, in his godliness. We have that combination coming together. So 14 is standing more for a perfection, a completeness. And when we see it three times in this verse, we can easily think of the Trinity. That we're seeing the triunity of God. We're seeing he, God the Father is perfect. God the Son is perfect. God the Holy Spirit is perfect. Man, when he is living in, in, in rightness with God, is living a perfect life. We see it, 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 it given to us an example by 14. So 14 gives us an idea of more of a godly line, not a line of apostasy and rebellion. Does that mean everybody in the line all the way down to Messiah lived that way? No, I wish it were true, <laughs> but it's not. But we just see the contrast, just to give you a contrast in numbers. We don't have what every number means in scripture, but we have a lot of numbers that were given the meaning just by seeing like every time that number is mentioned, it's bad. Every time this number is mentioned, it's good. You know, we see these differences. So if it doesn't mean anything to you, I wasted five minutes for you. Sorry. You never waste time. I don't feel it's a waste because I want to dig every every little nutrient and goodie out I can get. And so to me, it all is important. If God bothered to put it in there, it's important. If he tells me it 13 times, it's important. Okay? We'll go back, though, to chapter 5 and verse 2. Because I did tell you we were going to move a little faster. You'll see. We'll start picking up speed here. Not that we're running any races. But, uh, oh, and I, I, didn't, I didn't finish something. Wait a minute, because I haven't done all of verse 1. We have the book of the generations of Adam. In the day when God created man, he made them in the likeness of God. I guess really why I didn't say anything here is because we went through that when we went through God creating mankind, that man was the only thing God created made in the image of God. The animals were not, the fishies were not, the birds were not, you know, anything else alive was not. That was the one thing that made the human stand out and be greater than all the rest of the creation was the fact that we were made in the image of God, in the likeness of God. Verse 2 tells us again, we remember he created them male and female. He blessed them and he named them, and you may have the word man, you may have Adam, the Hebrew really is Adam. He named them Adam. But if you have mankind, what that's what God's saying. He's not saying that Eve was a man when he created her because we know she was female. We know that, that God had shown Adam there was male and female in all the animals. Where's his mate? He was male. Where's his female? So it, mankind is a general term. It used to be very acceptable. It used to be acceptable to put the woman under the he pronoun. It's only because of our depraved generations that we have issue with that. But I do find it interesting. In the Hebrew, the man and the wife are named Adam. She goes by his name. Is that, and I'm only questioning because I don't have the answer, but is that how we got our tradition of when the gal gets married, she takes the husband's name? Now, if you all know how that started and it's not true, bring it out sometime. But I, not knowing, wonder, is this where the custom developed? They took the name of the man. Don't know. Okay. Uh, wait a minute. Yes. So when did Eve come in? I mean, the name Eve come in? Here. She was named individually Eve, Hava, actually, which meant life giver because... God gave her she's the birthing person. She's the birthing person. <laughs> Thank you. You want to teach? You've got the great vocabulary today. <laughs> so she was, she was named that right in the beginning. Okay, they're always saying birth. Can't say mother anymore. Or birthing person. I just had to throw oh, my sorry. face. No, I had to throw my face here the other day. So I'm with you. This world is sick. <laughs> yes, Rhonda. Where did it say that uh, Adam and Eve had the same were referred to as Adam? Right here. Right here in verse 2 in the Hebrew. In verse 1, I'm sorry. No, 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 verse 2. Uh, where it says, he blessed them and named them. The Hebrew says, and named them Adam. Named them Adam. That's what? the Hebrew word. 
What, what, what site? Where? Ch chapter 5, verse 2. Okay, verse 2 we read in our English, we read, He created them male and female, and He blessed them, and named them Adam in the day when they were created. That's how it reads from the Hebrew. Oh, mankind means Adam. Mankind means Adam. Oh. Man, mankind, whatever your scripture has, it means Adam. That's the, the Hebrew word. Adam is the Hebrew word. So that's where, you know, we're, we're very clear. We know it's Adam and Eve. We know in Hebrew it's Adam and Chava. But he didn't say that here. He put them together um, the same way we have been able until recently to use the terminology mankind or something like that. You know, it was okay. It wasn't looked upon as, oh, we're leaving the poor women out. <laughs> so, okay. So he's made them both. He's blessed them. And uh, from the day they were created, that's how he referred to, to them. And it's clear in Genesis um, 1.26, isn't it, that he made male and female, he created them. You know, we know. It's just, it was the collective word. And today, it's becoming less common, or it's hyphenated now, where the woman keeps her partial, you know, keeps her name and adds his on. But you go back you know, 50 years ago, and the woman always took the man's name, and, and it was acceptable. You know, it was, if you had a name you didn't like, you had a chance of getting a name you might like. <laughs> My dad's niece was, her last name was Brown, and she was teaching school. And when she was leaving to get married on that weekend, she told her children on Friday, today you have, have called me, and called me rightfully, Miss Brown. When you see me on Monday, you may call me Mrs. Brown. <laughs> she literally went from brown to brown. <laughs> she didn't get a change. <laughs> but not all do that, we know. Okay. So, verse 3. When, and, and I'm laughing because some of our Jewish names, okay? A Finkel bomb would be very happy to marry a, someone with the last name of Gold. Both of those are very Jewish last names. But if you were female and Finkel bomb, you would love to take your husband's name if his last name was Gold. Believe me. <laughs> okay, you understand. We need a little humor in here. Verse three. When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and he named him. Seth. And we've already pretty much talked about the fact he was 130 years old when Seth was born. We're not told how old Adam was when Cain and Abel were born because that's the question that, that's going to be asked. I'm going to tell you he definitely was younger than 120 or 125 because Cain and Abel had to grow up and be adults that were making sacrifices. There had to been time there for that to take place for Cain to kill Abel for Eve to get pregnant again and have Seth. So there, there was an age difference between there. How much, we don't know. But they're not even counted in genealogy because their line was cut off. Where's Cain's progeny? It goes to Lamech, and then we lose sight of it. They came to nothing. Abel doesn't even get a chance to have offspring, or if he did, they're not named because they're not in the godly line that's going to be the messianic line that we need to know about. So right from the beginning, the only line that we're being told about now is the line that's going to fulfill Genesis 3.15, the prophecy of the Messiah coming. So Abel's cut off by death. Cain's cut off by sin. The redeeming line, Seth, we're going to have all the way down. It's going to keep going. Now, when it says he was 130 years, what does years mean? If it is Jewish years, which I think likely was put into motion because you don't hear that there was a calendar change when you have the Jewish race, a Jewish year always has been 360 days. And when they calculate back to the time of like Adam's birth or Abraham's birth or you know when they go back to these patriarchs and give you about when they were born they're doing it on the basis of a 360 day long year now our Gregorian were 365 and a quarter days the 360 days 
does end up unbalanced in time because you don't have the extra. So every so often, and I think it's like about every six to seven years on the Jewish calendar, they add in a whole extra month. They have a leap month. We just came through that. We had a Dar 1 and we had a Dar 2. That's why a lot of things came a little later on our English calendar as far as the dating, where sometimes, like sometimes Passover's in March and this time it was mid-April. It's because that they added in that, that extra month to get them back on track, the same way we add in the extra day to make up for that portion. Otherwise, if you kept going through thousands of years off, you'd end up with spring wouldn't be in springtime anymore, and Pesach, Passover wouldn't come in the springtime when it has to come, so forth and so on. But how long ago was the Gregorian calendar created? I don't remember when Pope Gregory is when it's named after. Um, it's in the early centuries, um, I think. Somebody want to Google that fast? They can probably get an answer. Ask when the Gregorian was calendar a, was started. Wasn't that a Gregorian king, or what was it that was in charge? I, I think it was a pope. A pope. I think it was pope. Maybe maybe it was king, but I think it was pope. Pope Gregory is what's in my mind. Um, Patty's Googling. She'll get us answered in a minute. The Gregorian calendar goes by the sun. It measures time by the sun. You have to have that equinox day. That's what keeps us having spring and spring, summer and summer. That's why something like Ramadan that doesn't follow either moon or sun and their orbital paths, you have Ramadan all over the page. Right now Ramadan is in our early springtime. There's years you can find Ramadan in September or October. It, it fluctuates greatly. Yeah. 1582. And was that late? 1582. And was it Pope Gregory the, that it's named after? Yep. Yeah, Pope Gregory in 1582, but it was being practiced before that, I'm sure. Because we don't have calendar change then, I don't believe. We'll do a little research and we'll see what we come up with. It's a good question. But the Jewish um, timing has been by the lunar, the, the orbit of the moon, and it's been continual from when time began as far as we can tell. Remember when we had <coughs> God put in seasons, times and seasons, we got that I think in chapter 2, pretty sure it was chapter 2 in Genesis, I should know, it could have been in chapter 1 still, but one of the two chapters, and those seasons, we see the times and all that, we see going by the moon. We still have those. They're called the appointed times. In Hebrew, they're called the Mo'adim. The Messianic that are keeping everything that they can from Scripture will acknowledge when, a, when the new moon starts, when, when the cycle starts again. And they even have a celebration usually that night. They're following the 30 days that it takes the moon to go around the earth. And then, like I say, because it actually takes... It gets them off in a period of time. They'll add in that extra month to get it back on track. So spring is still spring, fall is still fall, so forth and so on. So the Jewish people go by the lunar. Gregorian is by the solar, following the sun's orbit around the earth. The only reason why I say it is when you get into prophecies where you're looking at the years, like when we know that the decree went out to rebuild uh, the, the temple and the streets of Jerusalem was April 14, 1445 B.C. And you want to calculate down to when Messiah came in on his triumphal entry called Palm Sunday. According to scripture, we, we could know exactly when that day was because we knew how long it was supposed to be. And that, if you calculate it by the sun, you'll come out with the wrong date. If you calculate it by the Jewish keeping a time, you will come out, as Adrian Rogers said, they should have booked every hotel room. They should have had a front row seat. They should have known right when Messiah was going to come because it was declared. When you hear that decree go forth, it would be X amount of days when Messiah would come through and be cut off yet not for himself. So it, scripture is very exact. We can be very exact in the timing. We see the exactness when we look at the period of the tribulation. When it says at the midpoint, there's 1260 days. There's three and a half years. Three and a half years is times, times, and a half a time. Again, we're talking lunar years there. We're talking 360 day years there. But you, we can be very exacting because it has kept that exacting through, through time. Okay?
Not okay. I have you confused. <laughs> well, is that how come um, our year is such a year and, and, and the other calendar is another year? Yes. Israel, Israel, sorry. The Jewish calendar is year, if I'm remembering, if I'm recalling, 5,782. Oh, Rochelle, I should know this. I quit staring at it. Um, that's okay. Google, Google the what what number the Jewish year is. It's 5,780 something. I think it's 82 because they're counting back and they can get pretty close. They know that the, that there's some areas they have a little trouble with that they can't have exactly. But they're saying basically man is about 5,780 years old because they're timing time from when Adam began. What year is Jewish year? What this Jewish year? What year is it? Oh, today. The year, not the oh, date today, but what year? What what's the Jewish year? I can run up. Six thousand. Yes. No, no, no. Oh, 5782. 5782. I was right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 5782. We say 2022 because we date from year one when the calendar changed from BC to AD. So we say 2022 AD. AD is anno domino domini. Domini, not Domino, in the year of our Lord. It's a Latin phrase, in the year of our Lord. B.C. meant before Christ. Now, because people didn't want to date a calendar by a person they don't want to believe in who were saying this is when God was born in human flesh, they've changed it to be the B.C.E. era. And they call it before the common era, B.C.E. The common era is starting counting up at year one because you don't have a year zero and the B, the bcs are before the common era but they were called for hundreds and hundreds of years before christ and in the year of our lord bc and ad but even if you count from ours and you count backwards adding up all the years behind they, they came out pretty close they're just you know little differences and again nobody's got a perfect calendar They've got a few little hookups, but they say, I've heard it's not true, and I've heard it's true, but they say that they can calculate to the time when the sun stood still in Joshua's day. I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry, folks. <laughs> Thank you. They say that they, they can identify the missing day. I, like I said, I've heard both sides, that that's true and that's not, but there's, there are issues, there are time periods that we don't know exactly, but we get close. In other words, do I believe that Adam is 15 million years old? No. I believe he's pretty close to 6,000 years ago that Adam was created. We're, we're close enough, which throws out the evolutionary process once again. But there's, you know, there's just no reason for it. Is that the age of our Earth? No. Remember, it's our Earth was recreated. We went through that, that it was not created chaotic. It became chaotic. It was recreated. The original creation was man. That's, that was, the, you know, God used a different word. Remember we studied that? that? When he created man, it was a new thing out of the, out of the earth. There's a the couple of times when he created new, but there's the other where it said that, you know, he had made, he had created. He could have been bringing them back into play with our earth during that time. So the earth could be who knows how old. So when science says that they can see ages that are much older than man, yeah, I can believe that. What they don't find in those ages is bones from man. They don't find their missing link. They're half fish, half dog. <laughs> they don't find, you know, they don't find any of that. But yet they'll still claim it was thousands and thousands, millions and millions of years. I remember being a child turning on a, um, it was a fun science program for kids. But it, very quickly I realized it was teaching evolution. The day that I turned on to it, it was telling about the giraffe. Why does the giraffe, giraffe have a long neck? And it said because where the giraffe lived, at first the giraffe had a very short neck. And the foliage that the giraffe ate was within reach. But because 
the prolificness of the earth became less, they had to reach a little higher to get to the leaves that were a little higher. And so in, in that one generation of giraffe, its neck grew an inch. And then its baby had to reach two inches, so it grew a neck two inches taller, and so on, and so on, and so on. Well, number one, where's the, the remains of a giraffe with a short neck? Anybody ever find one? <laughs> Never have the scientists discovered it. And number two, I'm a short person. I've reached all my life, and I haven't added a hair to the, my frame size of what I am as an adult. We, go down. <laughs> we shrink. <laughs> we shrink. So I don't see the evolutionary process prove true. And I loved, it even came out of Reader's Digest, I'll give them credit, I loved that they said, I don't believe in evolution because if evolution were true, mamas would have eight arms and the octopus would have one. <laughs> <Amen>. <laughs> I do not see that we are improving in our human existence anywhere from Adam to down to us. <coughs> so no, no. It really spins it on its head. But I do want you to realize I have no problem with an old earth. It can be a lot older than Adam. We have no idea. You know. But do I think the scientists have it right? No. <laughs> okay, back on track. I really thought we'd move faster, but we will. We'll still get there. What we need to see besides the years now, we've talked about that. Adam had lived 130 years. He became the father of a son in his own likeness. Do you notice the difference in that phrase? Who was Adam made in? The likeness of God. Now we have Seth, who's going to be a godly son, but he's still made in the image of Adam. He's made in the likeness of Adam. Why? Because when Adam sinned, we lost that <coughs> being made in the likeness of God. Remember, there was a change in them. They knew they were naked. They hid. There was some change, that likeness of God, that Shekinah glory that maybe enshrouded them was gone because they cannot um, cohabit in sin. So now, Adam's in sin and his children are made in sin. You know, when they come out of the womb, simple. Yeah, I know. They're sweet little darling babies, and every mama has a perfect child. True. Until that child hits a, a few months or a year old or two years old and begins to show that it's got a temper and that it's got a selfish streak and a few other characteristics that aren't quite as adorable, even to mom. <laughs> but did mom teach that child to be that way? No. No. We, we see... <coughs> stubbornness, we see selfishness, we see everything long before we can be programming them. So it just, and we're told, we are all born in sin, we need to be born again, born of the Spirit, born above. And as we even read earlier, you're born naturally first, the earthy Adam, then you can be born spiritual and be part of that redeemed race. Remember I said there's two races, the federal race, the Adamic race, that all human, if you're born, and if the, uh, every human being born comes from Adam, but only those who choose to be born again are the ones in that redeeming race that have, for our federal head, Messiah himself. So, today the human race can trace back to Noah, but we know that Noah traced it back to Seth, to Shet in our Hebrew. So all of our human race. If Adam's son is in his own likeness, then Seth's son is in his own likeness. And Seth's son's son is, and so forth and so on. We're all born as sinners, all in the need of a savior. Okay? All right. Verses 3 and 4. I think we can do these together. Um, when Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness. We've covered that according to his image and named him Seth. We had done three, sorry. Okay, then verse 4. Then, then the days of Adam after he became the father of Seth were 800 years. That's why we know Adam lived 930 years. He lived 130, had Seth, he lived 800 more. 
and he had other sons and daughters. There answers the question for everybody who says, hey, wait a minute, where'd the girls come from? And then as soon as you say that brother married sister, everybody goes, oh, you know. But back then it was pure. It wasn't, even though everyone was born with a sin nature, you didn't have all the genealogical issues that now inbreeding bears, you know, mongoloid and so forth, you know, that wasn't there then. God enabled them to procreate through. So Cain did marry a sister. Uh, Abel would have, or did, and we just don't know about it. Now, here's the interesting thing. There was plenty of time for daughters to be born. We know Cain had one. You know, we know the offspring there. One writer estimated, if Adam during his lifetime saw only half the children that he could have fathered grow up, and if only half of those got married, and if only half of those who got married had children, so you see I'm slicing it down smaller and smaller, even at that conservative rate, Adam would have seen more than a million of his own descendants in 930 years. I say that to help us realize this is a bigger picture than we realize. I picture in my little finite mind one little family, one little family that, you know, had this group here and this group here, kind of like today in my Pearl family, there were three children. Those three children, here's this family, here's this family, here's this family, and I'm just looking at, you know, that little, but it, Adam, if he saw half of his kids, half of those kids got married, half of the ones who got married had kids, by the time you get down to the time of the flood, you have that he could have seen a million of his own descendants. That's, That's staggering. Mind -blowing. It is. It's staggering. I see Patty over there just like, really? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's amazing. Using those calculations, <coughs> by the time of the flood, you know, Adam has seen in his lifetime, he didn't live to the flood. He lives close, but he didn't live to the flood. But by the time you get just a little bit further to the actual time of the flood, they believe, and I've heard scientists even say, they believe that at the time of the flood, there easily could have been seven billion people living on this earth. Wow. Yeah. Wow. We're, we're supposed to be about at that now, but look at how many more people it took. So I'm going, and I'm throwing this number out. I'm not saying it was, but Adam and Eve might have had 50 kids. You know, I don't even know the numbers. My source that I took my, my theory here from didn't say how many kids they based it on. They just said if half of his kids got married. So I don't know what number they started with. I tried to find it and it didn't give it. <laughs> But whatever, they took a number and they went with it, ran with it, and got that. And like I say, there's, there's reasonably from calculations of things that were given that there were 7 billion people on this earth at the time of Noah. That that's a lot more than what we realize. Okay, so, Daddy Adam, you were busy. And I think I know what you did a lot of your time. Can you imagine the number of diapers? <laughs> certainly weren't plastic back then or we wouldn't have made it to <laughs> today would we have okay so we're going to go to verse 8 all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died okay he lived almost as long as his dad his dad lived 930 he lived 912 but what we're going to see through this chapter you're going to hear that phrase over again and again and again and he died and he died and he died and he died. The story of each one is, and he died, with one exception. That one exception is the one that we know, Enoch, who did not see death. Now, we'll talk about that in just a moment, but the record of man's weakness, man's subjection to the rule of death, goes all the way back to what happened in the garden. Go back with me to remember Genesis 3, 4, because even though we're only in chapter 5, chapter 3 and verse 4 was a long time ago. So just to remind you, it says, The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. Remember, he's enticing her to eat the tree of good and evil. That God had said, if they ate from that tree, dying, they would surely die. And it was talking spiritual, immediate, physical would follow. So, was Satan lying? <clears throat> yeah, flat out 
liar. Because if he wasn't lying, then why do we have in chapter 5, and he died, and he died, and he died. Because remember, in God's plan, Adam and Eve were to live forever in a garden setting, and they were to proliferate. They were to have children. So they were to be the, what do you call it, the birth, birth mamas, <laughs> birthing persons. <laughs> you know, it, children are not because of sin. <laughs> Children were promised before sin. I googled. Okay. And according to the Britannica, which I assume that's... The Encyclopedia Britannica. Yeah, Eve had 20 sets of twins, and they had 40,000 offspring. Oh my goodness. Oh my okay. Goodness. Now this is, this is Britannica. This is not twins. Bible. But it's saying Eve had 20 sets of twins, uh -huh. and they had 40,000 offspring. Okay, now again, <laughs> we're just coming up with numbers we don't know, but we do know they were filling the face of the earth. They were doing what they were supposed to that do. Could, that could come up with a million people. Yeah. That many. Exactly. Ooh. Exactly. We're just, we, I limit everything in my mind. I think very finite. I have to sometimes have my <coughs> top blown off. Wow. Even if it is covered with hair. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. One thing common to man, death and taxes. <laughs> I guess that's two things, but you know, the, the expression that man can count on death and taxes. Well, our very own exception is Enoch. Now, I'll blow your mind a little bit further. Adam died during the lifetime of Enoch. Enoch was alive Probably, well, no, I can tell you definitely, okay? About 57 years before Enoch was translated into heaven, went to heaven without death, is when Adam died. Enoch was 365 years old when he went to God's house. So Adam and Enoch lived on this earth together over 300 years. For me, that was a wow. <laughs> okay, I put Enoch over here and I put Adam over there. I've got to see they overlap 300 years. And because they're not all over the face of the earth yet, because we know what happens in chapter 11 with the Tower of Babylon where God had told them to spread out and they weren't, and he makes it so they do, we know easily Adam, Adam and Enoch, Hanuk, could have easily had fellowship together. They easily could have spent, had meals together. I'm not telling you they lived under the same house, you know. But, but wasn't uh, Adam Enoch's great great grandfather? Seven generations. So put in how many greats you need. Yes, Enoch was the seventh generation from Adam. Yes. Lamech the seventh and Enoch the seventh. Went through Cain, went through Seth's line. So, looking at verses 5 on, here in chapter 5, going back to chapter 5, we're going to get quickly the years, okay? And I'll bring out a few other things when I need to, but right now, verse 5 tells us, um, so all the days of Adam, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Okay? Seth lived 105 years, became the father of Enosh. Then Seth lived 807 years after he became the father of Enosh, and he had other sons and daughters. So notice he's got other kids, but Enosh is the only one that matters. And we're never told how many other sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years old, and he died. Enosh lived 90 years and became the father of Canaan. So by 90, anyway, they're having offspring. We don't know if that was he was an old daddy or a young daddy. <laughs> but he lived 90 years, and he gave birth to Canaan. Then he lived 815 years after he became the father of Canaan, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Anash were 905 years, and he died. So obviously we see a pattern here. They live about 900 years. Canaan, we're going to see, lived 910 years. We read that as we go on, that he lived 70 years and became the father of Mahalalel. I have to... Uh, Make sure I don't run too long on that name. Then Canaan lived 840 years after he became the father of Mahalalel, and he had other sons and daughters. Notice how they all had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. 
Here's our phrase again. So how about Mahalalel, the one that was important? Because Mahalalel, we read in, in verse 15, lived 65 years, became the father of Yared, that's Jared. Then Mahalalel lived 830 years after he became the father of Yared, and he had other sons and daughters. Then guess what? All the days of Mahalalel were 895 years. He didn't quite make it as far, and he died. Now, to continue his line, Mahalalel, we'd go down to verse 20, but we're not going to jump down there yet. We're going to stay in order. And so we're going to see in verse 18, Jared, Jared lived 162 years and became the father of Enoch. That's because here we go. We want to look at Enoch. Enoch's name in the Hebrew means dedicated. Yes? No. Because I was going to say, okay, it goes, they're younger when they start having kids. Okay, they got younger each time? Uh, except this one, because this one lived 162 years before he had a knee. Okay, yeah. so he was an old father. Yeah. Okay, okay, I missed that, very good. And we count, if we counted back and counted those names, Enoch is our seventh one from Adam, the seventh generation. Mm -hmm. Now because of that, and we know Enoch, we know he's very godly, we know that he, he walked with God, and, and as one said, they walked and they talked together, you know, all the time. And they walked so far one day that God said, you know what, you're closer to my house than yours. Why don't you come home with me? And he wasn't found. That's a nice way to put it, but we do know however it is that God took Enoch in a miraculous way so that he was not found. There was no body found. There was no burial for Enoch. He was, um, in essence, raptured. Not the rapture we talk about in the Prachash on the New Covenant, but in essence, he is a picture for us, definitely, of the rapture, of those who will not see death, won't taste physical death, and will be caught up and go home to live with the Lord in the place he has provided for us um, forever. I lost my train of thought, sorry. Go with me to Jude 14. Jude's that little book. Um, Jude. Jude, verse 14. There's no chapter, so I'll say Jude chapter 1, verse 14, but there is, there's only one... Oh, I got judges on my tablet. I typed wrong. Okay, now I'll be in Jude. Jude 1 and verse 14 says something very interesting. We've just read that Enoch, we've read the names and I've told you he's the seventh generation. Enoch pops, I mean, Jude pops up and says, it was also about these men that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all, to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way, all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him, against the Lord. And then it goes on and, and names some, they were grumblers, and etc., etc. Okay, but notice how Jude got it exactly right, exactly what Genesis has told us, that Enoch was the seventh. But notice what it's saying that Enoch knew in that generation. He knew that there was a day coming when the Lord would come with many thousands of his holy ones. When he comes with those thousands of holy ones, he's going to execute judgment. He's going to convict the ungodly of all the ungodly deeds, all that was done against all those who spoken against him. Now, when did that day happen? When did I didn't understand. When did the day happen that the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones and executed judgment upon all the ungodly and those what ungodly... What is going to happen when Christ comes back? Dora gets a gold, gold crown. <laughs> Yay. It has, <laughs> it has not happened. I threw a curse saying, when did it? But she said, absolutely right. That will happen when we return, and we're part of that thousands that return with Christ, when he comes down to set up his kingdom on this earth, stops the battle of Armageddon, stops the ungodly ways, sets up and rules in Jerusalem so that the earth knows a thousand years of peace. Amazing. I don't think the earth has had a thousand days of peace. Probably not a thousand minutes of peace. Not like it will have a Messiah is ruling on this earth. But that is future. Now we're looking to it and we feel very close. And rightfully so. 
with all the, the prophecies that have been fulfilled, knowing nothing needs to be fulfilled for us to be caught up. Once we're caught up, then we can come back down with him. We know that that time between caught up and, and coming back is seven years. <laughs> You can argue that, but I'll give you scripture time and again for it to be seven years. So we know that if the rapture came today, and we were caught up today, about seven years from now we'd be coming back down to earth with Messiah to see him set up his kingdom and fulfill what Enoch knew when he was only seven generations from Adam. And he was so far back, if we're year 5,782, if Enoch and Adam overlap 300 years of their lives, then we're looking at 5,400 and some odd years before it would ever happen. But he knew it. How did he know it? God How did he know it? God showed him. Remember, God and Enoch walked and talked together. That tells me that Enoch got a taste of what Adam and Eve had in the garden. And Enoch didn't fail the test of staying right with God. So, very interesting. Not that Enoch was perfect, sinless, no, 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 I'm not saying that. He had to be making the sacrifices, looking toward the Redeemer coming also, just like everyone else. If God ever had a perfect human, why would he have bothered with all the rest? Yeah, it just, why would he have redeemed? Why would Yeshua Jesus have died if there was one that could get to heaven on their own? But since no one could, he took care of it. So, Enoch's a very interesting character. I would love to ask him, tell me about your conversations with God. What did he share with you? What was it like? But I think God laid out for him the whole plan of the ages. The same thing that excites me when I get to study it. Look at prophecy. See them looking back. I see fulfillment and looking forward. I know we will see that complete fulfillment of every word God has promised. The same way that Yeshua, when he raised from the dead, before he ascended back into heaven, had a very special walk. Oh, and I've given anything to been a, a little bee buzzing along with them and just listening. You had two men very depressed, very heartbroken. This one that was so precious to them, the Romans had taken and he had been crucified. They were down <laughs> in the dumps because of that. They were in confusion because of it. They have a third man join them on their walk. It's called the road to Emmaus. They had a, a, this third man join them and say, why are you downtrodden? Why are you so unhappy? And they're kind of like, where have you been? Weren't you around this week? All, you know, this horrible, what, what just happened, and this was at the time of Pesach, and all that, that they said, and it's, we're told that this third person started from the scriptures and explained all things to them. He, I'm sure, took them from Genesis 3.15 through all the prophetic scriptures of his first coming, helping them realize who he was. By the time they're, they're going to get it, they've come to a place where they've said to him, look, you know, the night's coming on, stay in lodge with us. And it says that their hearts were burning within them. Can you imagine talking with the author of the word of God, the one who fulfilled it, the one who wrote it and then fulfilled it? Can you imagine? I mean, yeah, I'm sure their hearts are burning. If you get under a good teacher and the teacher's teaching you, you get excited by the Word of God. You feel it, and, and it's meaningful to you. And I just, I, I think they just didn't want to let go. Don't go on. Come, teach us some more. And then when Yeshua, they were going to have a meal together, have that fellowship. And when he made the blessing, broke the bread, and I don't know if it was matzah or not, but when he gave the Hebrew blessing, their eyes were open and they suddenly realized they were in the very presence of the one that he had been teaching them all about. They were so excited. They didn't go to sleep. They got up from the table. Oh, and, and that's when the Lord disappeared. He was suddenly out of their presence. They ran all the way back. It's estimated 20 miles to where they'd left the other followers of Yeshua to burst in their doors in the middle of their night and say, guess who we just spent the day with? And I can only imagine the thrill and the excitement that they were sharing. The Word of God is alive. The Word of God is true. What God taught Enoch, we're walking through. We're, he was close to the beginning. We're close to the end. But everything in between has been fulfilled, completed, 
perfectly every dot on the I, every T cross in our Hebrew, every jot and every tittle. And that tells me that everything that is prophetic after we leave will be just as exactly fulfilled. So can those who get saved right after we go home know how much time they have left? Did they get saved and get in the Word of God? Yeah, they can know. They can know the midpoint of the tribulation. They can know when it's coming toward the, the end. And it will end just before because the Lord says he'll come back to shorten the days. Because if he didn't, no one would be left alive. Can you imagine being in a world where you think no flesh is going to be left alive? Hallelujah, that the Lord comes back early and stops that for them. Not way early, but days early. We just don't know how many days, months, we don't know. But noticing my time is gone, um, let me just say Enoch being the seventh generation, verse 1, it was Adam. Verse 3, it was Seth. His name meant appointed one. Then we have uh, the Enoch that meant mortal frailty. Not the Enoch that gets translated that we just talked about, but they both have the same name. Then we have Canaan, which meant smith. So he probably was a smithy, blacksmith, you know, it was probably that type. We're seeing the development. Then Mahalalel that I referred to in this line, that his name means God be praised. It shows they were godly. It shows, you know, they were giving praise to God for the birth of Mahalalel. Yared, Jared means descent, like the descendant, you know. This is another one coming down in the line to Messiah. And finally, finally, we have Enoch, whose name means dedication. Are we as dedicated to the Lord as that godly line to me is showing? That's where we should be. I want to be that dedicated spiritually that that would be a good name for me. I want to be like Enoch. I want to walk with the Lord. I want to talk with him. But more than talk with him, I want to hear him. I want him to talk with me. <laughs> and I want to have my ear open that I might be dedicated to everything. Every breath I breathe, every action I do, every thought I think, I want to be dedicated to my Lord, pleasing to him. Maybe I'll be one that's caught up in rapture, because I believe it could be in my lifetime. If not, that's okay. If my earthly body goes to the dust of the earth, so be it. My spirit will be in heaven. <clears throat> Hallelujah for the promises that are ours. God's word, sure and true. Take it to the bank. Count on it. He'll never let you down. He'll never forsake you. And he'll never abandon his word. Praise the Lord. I found more. Um, this is from um, the Jewish historian, is it Josephus? Yes. Okay, that he wrote that the number of Adam, the, they're at, like the first line of children, not the grandchildren and nieces and daddy, 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 was, fifth, was 33 sons and 23 daughters. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, and Josephus was a Jewish historian in Roman times. Um, he was a very good historian. It could be that's accurate. Yeah. Well, and it says here that they don't have any way to prove, prove it, it, but they can't disprove it either. Right. So that's kind right. of... So it probably was the oral passed down through the Jewish people, that that's how many, and he was privy to that. Yeah, yeah. If they had 56, and each one of those 56 had 50 children, you could easily... Quickly, quickly <coughs> pop it. If, if the, that generation started having children earlier, could have been a lot more than that. Right. So right. that's just mind-boggling. It is. It is. And that's why when you think to the the time when we get past all this, and you got those who went into the millennium in human bodies, so they're still able to reproduce. They live out through the millennium. They haven't sinned against the Lord. They they are the ones that will continue on as Adam and Eve would have. They'll continue having children. Their children will continue having children. You can see if it only took to Noah excuse me, to be 7 billion and have the face of the earth full. Of course, not, I mean, we're 7 billion and there's room, but you know what I'm saying. You can see how there would be, in a short amount of time, a full earth. And that's where I love that theory. And, and hear me, theory, we don't have scripture and verse, but if God were to take another planet, make it habitable for man, pick up a group and put them on that earth, fill or that planet, Fill that planet. These always, you know, from this point on, Satan is gone, sin is gone. This is the way it would have been. 
And so you've got all this, this planet praising the Lord. You've got all of Earth praising the Lord. Now, these fill up again. They get people placed on other planets that God's made habitable for mankind. And they're growing up praising the Lord. And you go and start going into, you know, eternity time, and you've got all these planets with, with praise to the Lord going on. And, you know, they don't all have to look like Earth. They can look like, you know, different types. But maybe God makes the person habitable to the planet or whatever. But what a thought to just see all the heavens. You know, we're only talking the Milky Way. I haven't even gotten out of our own universe. How many planets are out there and how many, you know, what's beyond that, what's beyond our universe. The universe is a universe, but you take that out with people praising the Lord, praising the God of creation saying, you know, look at his creation, look at how amazing he is, look at his creativity. Wow. Wouldn't that be cool to be a part of that scene versus this scene that I turn on the news at night and then seven billion people are killing each other and, you know, you've got people crying and, and oh. But to see that contrast and to see all the heavens declaring the glory of God in a different way now than what that man originally Wow, <laughs> we have a new heavens and a new earth. How many planets are there? How, what other besides planets? What has God created for man? Let your imagination go, and I'll tell you, you're still falling Space short. Aliens. You're still <laughs> falling short. What do you say? Space aliens. Space aliens, yeah. Somebody said... They're actually when, people from other planets. Yeah. God has created. They are, they are, God yes. created everything. Right, right. Somebody was trying to explain when Jesus took on human form, and they said when he slipped on, when he zipped on, that's what they said, when they, the, he zipped on the human spacesuit. And I thought, okay, I see what they're trying to say. They're trying to help the kids understand, you know. I say he put on skin. He put on a face. We call him Yeshua Jesus. You know, he slipped into time and space and put on a face. They said when he put on the, the when he zipped on the, the human space suit, he was walking on our earth, you know. Just different ways to phrase it. But here's where let your imagination go and realize we're going to be in that eternity. We're not going to be bound by gravity. We're not going to be bound by, you know, we, we have to get in a car and drive somewhere. We have that new body. With the way the Lord appeared suddenly in that upper room, he came right through a closed door. He came right through the wall. He went right through the ceiling. However, you know, he's not bound. That's the type of body we're going to have. I want to see what Pluto looks like. I want to go hang out at, at the comets. I want to go see where the Hubble telescope has been showing us those gorgeous colors and designs that, that blow my mind. I want to go see it. I want to go stand there and go, wow, God. You know what I want to see? I want to see that 38 billion light years out there crossed in that yes. we've seen in that, I forget what they called that galaxy. But remember, there's that one galaxy that they said, what's it doing there? Oh just hanging around and then it was beyond that one that they get to this one that showed that form of that cross that if you haven't tell me to send you the link to that video oh my word it's my favorite all-time video it's only eight and a half almost nine minutes long i will watch it every day of my life and not get bored mm -hmm. with it but i want to go see those things i want to stand there with that cross in front and say wow God, <laughs> I just, I want to sing his praises, I want to shout the hallelujahs, I want to have a blast, I want to do flip-flops all the way, and uh, you know, I'll take a, a million years or so to meet all the Bible characters first before I go flying off and doing all that, I mean, people think you're going to be bored? Oh my word! Maybe the Bible characters will be traveling with you to go see Maybe that, so. You don't have to Maybe so. Have a group. Maybe so. Sure. They can be our children. <laughs> <laughs> Open up the mics for our people in Zoom. They're being left out. I see the enthusiasm. I see Dosi ready to bounce. You know? <laughs> so open up our mics, Roger. I'm going to close in prayer while he's doing that just so we can let conversation flow till it ends. But praise you, O oh God. You are the creator of it all. You are amazing. I, I need more words again, but ineffable, indescribable, amazing, and awesome. I will never tire of those words, and I know, God, that doesn't even begin to say who you are. But thank you for, in your magnanimity, caring about this little puny speck that's alive at just this point in time that you loved so much you died for me.
that you rose from the dead for me, that you have given me new life and a future so bright. As we joke and say, we've got to wear sunglasses and as S-O-N glasses. Lord, let me see you. Let me see your face. Let me be beamed up in your glory and let it happen now and continue on through all of eternity. And let me not leave out anyone of my beloved who are saying right now, hey, me too, me too, me too. Hear our cries, Lord. We so desire to be in your very presence. But while we're here, let us lead one more home too that they can have that joy also. We praise you and we thank you for knowing the truth of the word of God that gives us life in you. Hallelujah. Praise you in your holy name. Amen. Okay, let it out. Let's hear you and not me.